For those of you that don't know, Josh um, has accomplished a lot. He co-founded Garage Games, one of the largest gaming development companies at the time, which was the precursor of Unity. Um, and thanks again for helping us. Uh, you know, without you, CSC wouldn't have happened. <laughs> so just another shout out. Mm -hmm. And um, Guido, thank you so much for organizing one of the stages for day one of CSC again. And um, you know, your team has definitely uh, done some of the most phenomenal research um, in crypto economics. So I think we're going to have a really good, good discussion about games and crypto economics today. Um, can you guys give like a more thorough uh, introduction of yourselves? Sure. Um, just before I get into my intro, I also want to thank Steven and Ronan and um, John and Howard and the whole team for, you know, they, not everybody knows the story, but they actually, to make CESC happen, did a hugely heroic effort, including uh, diving into a burning storage container to pick up uh, some materials for the, for the, for the conference. Uh, there was a fire in the East Bay where it was stored. So you guys did a really phenomenal job. And um, CESC, I think, along with uh, Epicenter and Blockchain Week in general, it's just such a valuable thing for the community, so really appreciate your guys' efforts um, and, and PRISM groups too. Uh, quick background, um, I've been building technology companies for about, about 20 years. Um, started my first company straight out of high school. Didn't know what it, didn't, had no idea what I was doing, but it was in FinTech. Um, we created, at the time, the world's largest um, database and automated analysis system for derivatives um, in the world. Uh, we grew it. Uh, to a really big size, um, sold data streams basically to hedge funds, institutions, uh, market makers. Uh, so capital markets, kind of fintech background. Um, after we sold that company, um, jumped to Garage Games, which, uh, as Stephen said, was uh, at the time the world's largest uh, game development platform. It was really kind of at the cusp of the transition in games from retail distribution of box products with a very consolidated you know, centralized uh, set of a handful of publishers that really controlled the market uh, to the real diffusion uh, of the industry with the explosion of um, game developers, distribution on the internet, and right alongside that, the evolution of the industry's business model to digital purchases, digital goods, and ultimately the free-to-play model. Um, Garage Games also, you know, um, grew uh, really big. Um, we sold it um, in 2007, um, and since then, um, Mostly been in investing in different um, technology companies, helping um, friends with some of their companies. I got to know Kevin, who's one of the co-founders at Kabam, uh, uh, at Forte through his previous company, Kabam, which was one of the leading free-to-play game companies. Uh, I was an investor, shareholder there, um, and was really impressed with Kevin and, and the job Kabam did in navigating uh, a totally new business model in games which is, I think, what's about to happen again with the introduction of blockchain and, and blockchain gaming. Um, so that's me. Um, so very quick background. Uh, I'm the managing partner at Prison Group. Uh, we are an economic consulting firm based in New York. Uh, we were founded a couple of years ago by a group of our trade economists, and we have grown the firm. Um, you know, we, we have in our team uh, the former chief economist at Microsoft, uh, a Nobel Prize winning economist who was a professor Harvard University, we just announced earlier this week at the Crypto Economic Security Conference, and again, thank you, Josh, for making that happen. Uh, we announced a new initiative that is spearheaded uh, by Professor Ben Holstrom at MIT, uh, who co-won the Nobel Prize in Economics with Oliver Hart, who was our senior advisor, and Preston McAfee, uh, and it's targeting producing more economic research, bringing more economists into the fold of the blockchain sector. Uh, now, with regards to blockchain and gaming, um, we are, you know, very bullish uh, on the sector. Uh, we work across many different industries, healthcare, financial services, and gaming is where we think there is going to be that early adoption beyond crypto people, and, and I'm sure we're going to go into the panel, and there are many reasons why, and, you know, if we think about the type of work we do, thinking about, you know, how to create economies, uh, how to create, you know, a currency that's going to subsidize certain behavior, uh, the role of non-fungible tokens, you know, blockchain games have all of these components, uh, and, you know, there are different views on what's going to be more valuable, where you're going to unlock value, what are going to be the incentives for people to shift towards uh, blockchain-based games, and, you know, we're going to get into it uh, in the next few minutes. Awesome. Thanks, guys. 
Um, you know, let's, let's dive straight into gaming. I used to be a professional ga gamer um, quite a while ago, <laughs> and I've basically played every single game format you can think of, like FPS, RTS, RPG, MMO, um, and you know, can you sort of give some color into like what crypto economics is most relevant for? Which game format? Is there a specific one where it thrives the best? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I really think it will, um, if, if game developers um, start to adopt blockchain and tokenized assets and create um, equivalents to you know, the real world kind of free market economy in their virtual worlds, uh, I think that will transform actually the, the whole industry is really will impact um, most every genre. Um, that said, there's some kind of obvious places where it can start, um, and that's you know um, one of the things we think about a lot at Forte is you know many games already have marketplace-driven economies where there's a degree of freedom for players to trade with each other you know through an auction house in an, in an MMO for example, uh, or to specialize in you know different roles uh, in a in a game uh, and create, you know, kind of econ an economy um, uh, amongst themselves. Uh, there's also games that have, you know, large um, secondary markets, gray markets, black markets, uh, where players, because they so want to be able to trade with each other, even in ways oftentimes that developers don't allow because they don't know how to control it or design around it, um, it still happens. And so it's a huge market around that. So, you know, I think you'll start to see it um, happen in those sorts of games where there's already a marketplace economy or already a large, you know, kind of secondary economy, whether it's official or, or unofficial uh, first. And once it starts to take off, um, the, in, the game industry, you know, over and over has proven that um, when a model starts to work, developers are really early adopters. They adapt very quickly. Um, and so, you know, you'll see it spread through the industry. That's what happened with free-to-play you know, and kind of driving the, the industry from maybe 100 million gamers 15 years ago to 2.4 billion gamers now. Um, so I think it will happen, it will be slow at first and then all at once. Yeah, and to, you know, I second Josh's comments. Um, we think, you know, from an economic standpoint, it's like where, uh, you know, where are the incentives gonna be stronger for, for gamers to be attracted to the benefits of blockchain? Uh, we think about blockchain as, you know, giving you certain property rights on the assets that you create, right? The, the assets are no longer owned technically by the developing house. You own them. Uh, so definitely places where you, you, you do already have that phenomenon. As Josh said, maybe it's uh, off game and not really approved by the developer. But, you know, this has been going on for a long time. Uh, and those are going to be the areas like, you know, marketplace case where we, we think this is going to happen. Um, the interesting thing to, you know, how we think that the industry is going to shift, when we think about the macroeconomics aspect of the gaming industry, you have to consider that about 10% of games in the last 20 years have done 90% of the revenue. So to Josh's comment, as soon as we have one hit, you're going to see a lot of copycats and a very big, quick shift towards uh, blockchain-based gaming. So um, that's it. Yeah, that, I think that definitely makes sense. And I, I definitely want to ask, like, um, you know, when you, when you talk about these games, and there's the, a lot of these challenges with um, how we move forward with fighting, I don't want to say fighting, these like more centralized companies. You just mentioned, you know, 10%, um, uh, 10 games own 90% of the market share, right? So, like, how do we move forward in which, um, you know, all these more centralized corporations, companies, they want a more closed system, mm -hmm. they want all the revenue to themselves. Yeah. So how do we like go in a different direction and make things more decentralized, start building like a community where people are actually contributing and getting rewarded for it? Yeah. So games is not unlike many other industries where the biggest, most established, most entrenched um, players in a space aren't the first to adopt some disruptive technology, right? It's an innovator's dilemma where, you know, they're sitting pretty in the, in the industry today, um, but games is somewhat different from many other industries in that it's not totally consolidated. Again, thanks to kind of the decentralization of the internet itself uh, and the ability to reach consumers directly uh, with games. There are tens of thousands of, of game studios, you know, around the world where they desperately want to find, you know, a new model um, that, can, that can help them um, 
succeed in a market that's you know largely consolidated, um, and that's happened, you know, as often as as it does repeatedly in the games industry uh, over the last 10 or 15 years in free to play, where you know it's really consolidated again to uh, a handful of companies that really sit at the top of the market. Um, so the big promise um, for you know many many developers uh, around the world is that um, blockchain can enable new game designs that players really, you know, to, to Guido's points, um, uh, engage with and feel uh, more agency in, uh, that they really care about, and that that gives them a new vector uh, to grow. And then, you know, what happens with the big companies is you'll see a smaller game take off, and they'll either copy it or, or, or buy it. But once the model starts to be proven out, um, or, or, or they'll be displaced, uh, but once the model starts to be proven out, you know, it, it catches fire. And the great thing about this is because the whole um, change that's driven by um, tokenizing um, assets, enabling player-to-player -player, uh, economies. Uh, the change that's driven is that the players start to own a piece of the game. Um, it's not just the developer. It's really a network of participants. The developer is one of the network participants um, that, you know, and we think uh, the models that will win over time are those that really treat, uh, that just define a, a protocol uh, with incentives that um, the developer adheres to, the players adhere to, uh, and that model you know, gives everyone more agency and ultimately leads to a bigger marketplace. Yeah, and I think to, to add on that, um, you know, when we think about what is it gonna take for a shift, you know, what, what, what is it gonna take for, for people to really start noticing you know, maybe a small studio? Uh, um, well, you know, so we're talking about people having property rights and being able to have a stream of income from their, their game. And sometimes we get asked, okay, is it gonna be like alternative to having a job? And we don't think about it from that standpoint, but really it's gonna be additional income in the gig economy that we are anyway moving towards. And when we think about the numbers, I mean, you don't have to provide thousands of dollars of value to gamers. Uh, you know, the average household income for a family of four in the US, 2014, 2018 is $54,000. So just a few additional dollars every week is gonna make an impact and it's gonna drive incentives for people to take this very seriously. And so uh, I think we, we, you know, going back to my previous point, you know, as soon as you have one hit, to, to Josh's point, every big house is gonna take notice and either are gonna acquire these smaller shops or try to copy paste uh, the model, you know, onto their existing networks. Yeah, and just to build on that a little bit, you know, to Guido's point, it, it, it's right on, it kind of demonstrates how massive the opportunity is in, in you know, um, creating these peer-to-peer -peer or we, what we call um, community economies uh, in, in games. Um, if someone earns, you know, $100 a week from just doing what they, sorry, just doing what they love, you know, playing a game um, by, by either, you know, um, specializing in, in something in the game or being really good at it or doing tasks that others don't want to do, helping their clan mates, whatever it may be, you know, that's like uh, four, four or five thousand dollars a year. And if you had a game with just a million players, which is, you know, not a large game, there's games with hundreds of millions of players a month, uh, where, you know, you had a million players doing that, that's a, that's a four or five billion dollar a year game, which would be the biggest game that there is, right? So you can see even a small game could create a massive uh, economy by starting to incorporate these things. And, and if that happens, we think when it happens, it'll just drive, you know, massive change in the industry. And to be on Josh's point, uh, this has already happened in Second Life years ago. Uh, it was actually interesting. A lot of economists look at Second Life, how people specialize in providing specific services. Uh, you know, they, they built like a, a mill that was providing the flour, you know, in the, in the game. And of course, in that case, they made, they made all the income in Linden dollar, which was the native currency, and they couldn't really cash it out. But in this case, it will be made you know, in tokens that, that you can bring off to an exchange and actually cash them for, for fiat. So, uh, you know, the model has already been looked at. Uh, of course, you were still trapped by the fact that Second Life was owned by a publishing company, right? Yeah, so. that's, that's right. Yeah. So a lot of people talk about, like, um, you know, crypto just being a monetary medium of exchange for games. So, like, essentially, you know, tokens are for buying things um, on the digital gaming marketplace. But you know, personally, I feel like there's a lot more to it. And you know, there's ways in which you can involve the community where essentially uh, there's game developers contributing more 
uh, content creators, which is very important for gaming, right? So like, can you sort of talk about how that ecosystem looks like and, um, yeah, and some of the challenges that we may face? Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people, when they begin um, thinking about um, blockchain and, and gaming, they stop, as you said, at kind of, oh, there's a currency, and it, you just use it to pay for things in the game. Or the next step is they stop at NFTs. You know, uh, it's a collectible item. It's totally unique. Wouldn't that be valuable? And they're right. It, you know, those things could be valuable. But the, the real, um, the thing that will really unlock massive change is when the virtual worlds and games, again, um, start to reflect like real world economies um, where people can specialize, where people can trade with each other, where people can pay each other for, for services. Uh, when you do that, then, you know, yes, there'll be a currency, you know, and, and games already have virtual currencies, um, but it's not a medium of exchange. It's, it's just like our real world where there are, you know, currencies that people use simply for convenience so they don't have to barter. You know, it just expands the size of the, of the uh, economy. It's really the underlying services and goods in the economy that drive the economy size, not, you know, the particularities of the, of the currency itself. Um, and same thing for NFTs. There are unique items in the real world today that, you know, can have a collectible value, but they're a small portion of the overall economy. Uh, and so we think, you know, it, it will be exactly analogous in, in virtual worlds. Um, it's really difficult to figure out how to do that, how to do it at scale, right? You can have games with, an individual game can have multiple currencies and potentially thousands of asset types, you know? Um, so how do you create, if that's just one game, how do you bootstrap a liquid market where players know what things are, are worth? How do you provide liquidity in that marketplace? Um, how do you do that across you know, a network of hundreds or thousands of games, right? Uh, the combinatorics are uh, daunting. And that's something we've spent a lot of time um, on. And, and you know, we've learned a lot um, from the space in general. Uh, folks like Guido and, and, and Stephanie and, and Kathy at uh, Prism Group and you know, others in the space and kind of figure out how do we create these liquid marketplaces that create a great game experience for, for players uh, but also a thriving, vibrant market. And somebody's going to have to figure all that out for, to really unlock this. Yeah, and I, I think to build on Josh's point, there are sort of two things we think about from an economic standpoint. The first one is the value is going to be that players are going to be able to make a relationship-specific investment to the game, knowing that they're going to have the property rights on the goods and, and, and whatever uh, thing that they create in the game. Right? This is going to be their own. And we know that ownership is the biggest driver of incentives, right? If you own something, you're going to really care of it and you're going to invest in it. So that's one thing. Then to, to Josh's point, though, uh, you know, what, what are going to be the elements that are going to be important so that there is actually a functioning marketplace? And one of which, which is, you know, to build on this issue that there's going to be thousands and thousands of NFTs, different currencies, it's important to think about what are gonna be what we call the economics of information in this game. So for example, if everybody starts producing NFTs and also unique, how do I know what their value is, right? So is there any way to have posted prices or indication about pricing? And this is not so different from, for example, to the way eBay managed to figure out how to bootstrap their marketplace. Or, or in eBay, you know, you have lots of different items and you might not know, okay, what is actually the price I should pay? And so eBay gives an indication if you post something, okay, this might be the value for it. So we're going to probably see similar and there are going to be sometimes algorithmically priced or based on, you know, past history once you have, you know, a certain recurrence of, of sales. Uh, and the way you design these elements are going to basically lead to either a functioning marketplace where, you know, buyers and sellers can match efficiently and trade or marketplaces where, unfortunately, you know, maybe the cost of search is too high because, you know, I don't want to spend so much time as a buyer in identifying all the specific characteristic of this unique item and figure out, you know, is the seller selling me to a good price or a bad price, right? So there's going to be a lot of elements in the economic design that are going to be really essential and they're going to sort of, you know, be the difference between getting it right and having millions of users and getting wrong and, you know, ending as many games before, not really with adoption. That's right. Thanks, guys. Um, Josh, can you like elaborate a bit on you know, what Forte does and how, I don't want to say change, but how it's adding value um, to the gaming industry? Sure. And um, Guido, can you also elaborate, given how early games are right now, um, I'm sorry, given how early games are in crypto right now, <laughs> research is very important. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about you know, the, you know, the research your team is doing um, in crypto econo economics, specifically related to games? Sure. So quickly on Forte, 
When we go and talk to developers, many of them, especially those with existing marketplace economies or gray markets, um, black markets, are, have already been interested in incorporating um, token economies and you know, assets that live on blockchains uh, into their games, giving their players more agency and, and ownership and really creating a, a thriving economy around that, uh, which has been actually pleasantly surprising to see. Uh, but they're all just daunted by the technology. You know, how do you make it scale? Uh, how do you design an economy around this? And you know, bear in mind that free-to-play game developers are actually excellent you know, economy designers. They've just become accustomed to doing it in kind of a command and control uh, uh, economic uh, model. Um, so it's daunting to figure out how to really open it up for players to have the ownership and agency that Guido was talking about. Um, so we try to help with both those things. Forte provides uh, an SDK, basically, provides a, a platform um, for developers to easily incorporate um, uh, assets uh, that live on blockchains and anchor to public uh, layer one uh, ledgers, uh, and also to design you know, their economies uh, to incorporate with either an existing game uh, or you know, to design from the ground up for a full you know, community economy, a full peer-to-peer -peer, uh, economy. So we really try to focus on, uh, you know, on those two things and just make it easier for developers to, to design it and then to deploy it and, and scale it. So, you know, uh, to your question, Stephen, like we have seen a lot of research done on um, general gaming economies, right? So economies have been looking at games for, for a long time, for many of the reasons Josh just mentioned. Um, we think that, you know, the aspect that blockchain brings is really this property rights one, and, and, and it's going to drive uh, a whole new set of incentives, right, for, for people. Uh, we have, you know, launched earlier this week this um, research initiative to bring more PhD economic students into ventures, and we're looking to place some of them in blockchain gaming companies uh, to start testing, you know, doing applied research and A-B testing on uh, some of the assumptions that we have, you know, thought of it at the theoretical level. Uh, and the cool thing with games is that you can see results very quickly, right? Because there's thousands of people interact with the game any minute, so you can, you know, really do an A-B test and see uh, actually how does this drive more adoption or more, you know, more contribution from the gamer. So this is, you know, the right, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we're very bullish on the gaming industry also for this ability to quickly interact and get feedback, which, you know, if you think about, you know, pharma or others, it's, it's much slower, the cycle, so you can iterate uh, you know, in a, at a much slower pace, which, you know, leads to worse results. Mm -hmm. We're a bit over on time. In 30 seconds from each of you, um, you know, if we could fully utilize and leverage the potential like crypto, crypto, crypto economics in games today, how's it going to look like? Let's say for a game like Fortnite. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, whatever the game is, what's, what's really cool, if you can fully realize this, is that um, people could... Um, Again, have more ownership and agency in the games that they already love. Um, you know, if you take that further, um, it would allow you to focus on the parts of the games that you really like because you could just trade with players for, you know, for other things. Uh, and actually to, you know, start to earn uh, an income from just doing what you love, you know, as, as a person, you know, if you're a gamer or you're really into, you know, a particular uh, game or, or genre. And we th I think that's just, you know... Uh, awesome. That's a big part of what motivates us to, to help figure this out. I think it's increasingly important too, you know, uh, in the world where you see, you know, just in general people, um, you know, with the creator economy, trying to, trying to really figure out um, how to um, make a living from their passions. Um, and it's increasingly important in a world of automation and increasing in inequity. It's just, it's a really cool thing to try to try to enable. I think games will be a, it's all powered by blockchain, but games could be, a, you know, a great adoption vector for it. So, sorry, that was much more than 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think, you know, what, what we hope is going to happen is that everybody's going to become a prosumer, a producer and consumer of games. Uh, and to Josh's point, they're gonna, you're going to be able to really, like, uh, get a stream of income, and even if, it, again, as we mentioned, $100 a week is going to make a significant difference to the average U.S. family, um, and you're going to see this as part of the overall gig economy, right? Years ago, it, it would have been unthinkable that you would earn money driving your car with passengers that you don't know in the back. There is about 2.3 million Americans who do this on a weekly basis now, so the shift happens and happens quickly as soon as people figure out, okay, this this can really make a difference in my life. And again, you know, we're going to go towards 
you know, a, a market where you know, people receive income from many different streams and why not gaming since you know, people value actually games a lot and dedicate a lot of time and resources to them. So that's, that's the hope. Awesome, I look forward to it. Well, that's all the time we had. Um, thanks guys, and I definitely think like we should do a podcast about this because there's like a few hours of discussion that we should have. <laughs> That'd be fun. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.